a very warm welcome to everybody who's here to our annual Mick Aston lecture for 2021. Thank you indeed for coming along. It's a new experience for you, it's a new experience for us, and in a way this is a little bit of an experiment of how we host a webinar in this way. You'll find that the format is a little bit different from some of the meetings that you've had on Zoom elsewhere, um, because this is a webinar version of Zoom, so it is a little bit different. But this is our 26th annual lecture, and we named it after Mick Aston. Uh, as you know, Mick was uh, the leader of the very well-known Time Team for many years and made his uh, name and fame on the television in that way. But he was also a director of Cotswold Archaeology and he contributed an awful lot to our development and to the development of our culture that we still have here at Cotswold. Well, our topic for this evening is Roman Gloucester's Eastern Cemetery. It's a big subject and one that we're going to explore from a number of different angles through the work of three members of Cotswold Archaeology staff. Well, we've got a lot of people in the room and it uh, looks to me like there's still uh, people coming in. The first thing to say is that for the next few minutes, as some of you have already discovered, we're going to be using the chat box. The chat box is open for you to say hello to your friends and others that you can see around the place. And if you're able to let us know where you're coming from, where you're attending from, that would be really interesting as well. We're going to keep the chat box open just for a few moments, but when the presentations start, the chat box is going to close down. And as you'll see in a moment, we're going to move in another direction because if you've got any questions, and we'll be using them at the question and answer session at the end, add them to the box which is marked Q and A. So at the bottom of your screen, if you highlight your toolbar, you've got Q and A there, and you can write a question in there. There's some fantastic places that people are coming from. I can see, goodness me, Canada and all sorts of places as well. So hi, Cambridge, Massachusetts, I saw slip by there as well. Absolutely fantastic. He hello to everybody from literally around the world. So if you've got a question for the speakers, then put, pop it into the Q&A box and uh, we'll do our best later on to answer them. We may not be able to answer everybody's question, but we'll um, do as much as we can. So hi to everybody who's already said hello in the chat box. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. And by way of giving an introduction, I'd like to introduce Andrew Armstrong, who is the city archeologist for Gloucester City Council. And Andrew's going to introduce the site to us and say something about the background to it before the excavations took place. So Andrew, I think you're in the room now and we'll hand over to you and uh, take it from there. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, and it, I must start by saying it's really lovely to be asked to introduce this talk tonight. It's a, um, this is a really important site for Gloucester and it's a site that um, is particularly important to me um, because it was the first major excavation I had to deal with on joining the City Council in uh, 2012. So the um, what I'm going to do now is just talk through some of the background of what we knew about this particular site, the, the Eastern Cemetery of Gloucester, before Cotswold Archaeology got to the site. So um, to begin with, this is a rather old map of the site, for which I apologize, but um, what we're looking at here is the eastern edge of Gloucester. Um, and what we're seeing here is, is the site of what's referred to as the Barton Roman Cemetery. And um, archeologists had known there's a cemetery here for some time. So essentially here we have the eastern wall of Roman Gloucester. For those of you who know Gloucester, here's the Roman road running east out of the city. And over here are a cluster of Roman burials that were found in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, an area that was later to become the co-op. And then at this end, further south, a couple more burials were found as well. So um, archeologists have been aware that there were burials in the site for many years. Um, the first evidence from the actual College of Arts site, the site, the site that Cotswold Archaeology is gonna be talking about, this site here, uh, was identified in 1966, when the new College of Art itself was actually being constructed. Um, whilst those works were ongoing, the then assistant museum curator, John Rhodes, um, very, I think, very bravely um, got in amongst the building works and recorded a number 
of Roman burials uh, in the footings of the new building. So this is a plan uh, from 1966 um, showing the footprint of the College of Art building here. And then hopefully you can see plotted on this plan the 37 burials that were identified by John Rhodes on the site. And this was later written up by the archaeologist Carolyn Hayway. Um, and of these 37 burials, the majority were found aligned with or at right angles to the city walls, the city walls running across this angle here. Um, although there were some ones that were at a slightly different angle. Some of these burials had artifacts associated with them and some had evidence for wooden coffins. And also, um, whilst they're working on the site, the archeologists found two kilns, which I'll come back to in a second. These are located in the west of the site. These are some of the artifacts that were found by the archeologists. These included two silver finger rings, a jet bracelet, an enameled animal brooch, and, and various other bracelets, or whetstones and so on, all found in association with the burials. Now, John Rhodes also identified two kilns that I mentioned previously. These were Roman pottery kilns. Here's one and here's another. This is from the original site archive. Uh, and these were excavated and published by Bernard Rawls. Um, and Rawls felt that the kilns were contemporary with the Roman fortress at Gloucester sometime in the mid to late first century. And um, these were some of the first pottery kilns to be discovered in Gloucester. And obviously pottery being so important for how archeologists establish their dating systems, this was a very important find and it contributed greatly towards the establishment of pottery dating in the city and the type fabric series. Here's a cross section from the original archive of one of those kilns. And here is a photograph from a Bernard Rawls excavation uh, showing one of those kilns as excavated. Now, as well as an extensive and important collection of Roman pottery, Rawls also found a large number of these clay pipes. And um, I don't think anyone has ever satisfactorily worked out what they were for. These were produced at some point in the, in the late first century um, on or near these kilns. And um, none of the archaeologists working on the site could work out what they were being used for, but they may well have been um, part of the insulation of the kilns. Um, they may actually have been part of the structure, but um, I'm not unsure if any more have been found in Gloucester thus far. So after 1966 and the discovery of the kilns and the discovery of the burials, there wasn't a great deal of archeological work in this part of Gloucester until 1974, um, when works um, further down the road near Co-op uncovered a Roman sarcophagus. And here it is, it's quite a small sarcophagus, stone tomb. And here I think is an archeologist called Pat Garrod overseeing the transport of the sarcophagus to the city museum. Um, and that was found with another broken stone sarcophagus. And this one is now in the city museum itself. Just to the north of our site in 1991, um, Cotswold Archaeological, or the Cotswold Archaeological Trust, as they were, I should say, uh, found two more burials just adjacent to the site here and here. And this is literally next door to the site Cotswold are going to be talking about. So we, we know we're in a big cemetery. Um, this is the nightclub known as Cactus Jacks, if anyone's familiar with Gloucester. This was in here during some drainage works. So I myself joined uh, Gloucester City Council in 2012, and I've been working as a consultant in the city for some years before. And I was familiar with the College of Arts site. It was also called the Media Studies site at the time. And um, I, I knew it had a background as having had lots of archeology span in it. But um, because of the construction of the College of Art, um, it was widely assumed the site was very badly damaged. And there were any number of archaeological death-based assessments and studies for the site uh, stating that archaeological remains were unlikely to survive in good condition. And um, I was very much of the opinion that that seemed reasonable. I mean, it was a very large concrete building that had been built on the site, and it was unlikely that anything would survive. Um, so when I joined the City Council, and one of the major planning applications I had then had to deal with was the redevelopment of the Greyfriars part of the site inside the city walls, obviously very sensitive and this site here, which I, it was deemed would have less archeology. span um, We had agreed, my, myself and the, the manager from Cotswold Archeology span who was dealing with the site, that once the, all the buildings were cleared 
to a certain level, we would then put in some further trenches on the site to see if there was any archaeological survival. So we began, um, the, as the demolition works were ongoing, there was an archaeologist on site, a very, very experienced archaeologist who was monitoring the works. And um, we assumed that not a lot would turn up. And this, I'm afraid, is a very bad photograph, but hopefully you can see some red material at the bottom of this photograph, because um, I received a phone call fairly quickly when I was on site from the archaeologist saying that he thought something was turning up. And I, I wandered out and lo and behold, and you'll have to take my word for it, what we have here is, is, is a material associated with the kilns found by Rawls in 1966. And gradually, over a certain amount of time, myself and the archaeologists on site realized that actually um, the preservation on the site was very, very good. And uh, while the College of Art site had, had damaged archaeology where its foundations had gone in, actually archaeological remains everywhere else uh, survived in very good condition. And as Mary and others are about to tell you in a minute, um, it turned out that the site would have, would prove to have extensive and well-preserved archaeological remains, deeply stratified, complex, and important. And this is such an important site, both because it's a large-scale cemetery excavation, the first really modern large-scale cemetery excavation in Gloucester, but also for what it demonstrates about archaeological survival. Because um, it's easy to assume in a city as heavily developed as Gloucester that um, previous development would have destroyed archaeological remains. Um, and what this site is to show is that actually archaeology can often survive in heavily developed sites in very good condition. And, and going forward, as we regenerate the city and undertake further building work in the city, that is a very important principle to keep in mind, that good, important, internationally important archaeology can survive below modern building works. And that should inform our the careful attitude we take to all building work in the city going forward. Thank you very much, Tim. I'll hand over now to Mary. Grand, thanks, Andrew. That was absolutely tremendous. It's great to hear the background and also to get a little insight into how archaeology works in the sense that it's this uh, iterative process of making observations, undertaking desk based assessments, making some evaluations, and then eventually starting to work on the site itself. So thanks, Andrew, for that. We're going to turn now to our first speaker who's going to talk about the excavations, Mary Alexander. Mary is Cotswold Archaeology's post excavation manager and she's been working with us since 2002, having previously worked in Cambridgeshire and London. She's authored a great number of articles. Many of you probably have read some of her work. She's written and edited several of the monographs that we've been publishing over the recent years. Most recently, the monograph dealing with prehistoric archeology span on the road scheme between St. Clair's and Red Roses over in Carmarthenshire, which we published in 2019. But today her title is The Archeology span of the Graveyard. So, Mary, let's cue you in. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Alexander, and I'm the post excavation manager for the Glosscat sites. So, a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. First, I'll give some background information where the site is and why we excavated it, and a little about the archaeology and history of the area, followed by a description of the archaeology of the two areas we dug, called the Media Studies Site and Block M covering both the archaeology that predates the Roman cemetery, the Roman cemetery itself, and the evidence for how the area was used after the cemetery went out of use. And I hope you find it interesting. So our archaeological investigations took place on the sites previously occupied by the Glosscat campus on land on both sides of Brunswick Street. The land has now been redeveloped by Vistry, formerly Linden Homes, for residential use, but given the significance of the location, it was determined at the planning stage that archaeological investigation should take place before the development went ahead. My focus today is on the area on the east side of Brunswick Street, and I will have to leave the details of our archaeological investigations within the walls of the Roman town to another day. But first of all, I would just like to put the site in its context with a brief history of Roman and later Gloucestershire. In short, we know that the first Roman campaign fought at Kingsholm was established around 49 to 50 AD and was relocated 
about 65 AD to the location here where the modern city of Gloucester lies today. The legendary fortress ramparts and later stone walls were built to surround the fort, which in about 96 to 98 AD obtained status as a colonia or civilian town. A number of archaeological investigations in the late 20th and the 21st century have located Roman street alignments, civic buildings and dockside development, with more discoveries coming to light right now with the redevelopment of the city centre. The town was evidently very prosperous as high status buildings and wealthy material goods attest. Following the period of Roman rule, there's patchy evidence for activity within the city walls. And by the late seventh century, the town had an abbey and performed an administrative role. By the later post-Norman conquest medieval period, city parameters have been re-established along much of the street pattern with which we are familiar today. The town flourished in the medieval period as a centre of commerce and religion and was surrounded by suburbs and garden plots. In the Civil War, the town was re-fortified using the pre-existing city walls and the inner Roman defensive ditch. During the siege, the buildings beyond the defences that impeded the view of approaching forces were burnt and cleared, and this would have included the buildings on to the east of Brunswick Road, where our site is. When the Glosscap campus came up for redevelopment, a certain amount of information was already known about the potential of the site, and certainly enough to make archaeological investigation of the area a prerequisite of the development. It's a general feature of the Roman period that burial of the dead took place beyond the limits of the settlement, and Gloucester is no exception. Burials found at Southgate Street and to the south of the current development area, as well as a cluster at the top of Brunswick Road and on Barton Street, suggest either one continuous and extensive burial ground or two or three separate areas. When the Media Studies buildings were constructed in the late 60s, a rescue operation was launched and 37 burials were found, along with other features, including two Roman kilns. <clears throat> we began our archaeological investigations in 2006, with a series of evaluation trenches, which revealed 2nd to 4th century Roman pottery and Roman ditches but no direct evidence for either kilns or burials. Further trenches were investigated in 2009 in areas previously unavailable. Again, no in situ burials were encountered, although a layer containing redeposited human bone was found towards the east side of the site. At this point, we wondered just how much of the archaeological remains had survived, the landscaping works, the foundations and the basements of the media study campus buildings. But as it turned out, we were pleasantly surprised. And so to the archaeology. This is an aerial shot of the Media Studies site. Um, you can just see the um, uh, museum in the background there. In 2013, open area excavations began. The site was investigated in two parts. The area known as the Media Studies site was the first to be investigated and formed an L shape around the second area, known as Block M, which was investigated beginning in 2017. This was to fit in with the, the developer's building schedule. This plan shows all the archeological features and you can see that the preservation was remarkably good, although there were areas of significant truncation. The gaps you can see between the features show where the modern construction has penetrated the deposits below. And there was also some areas where there was horizontal truncation of the features from the previous construction work. This shot um, just shows the beginning of the excavations on the Media Studies site and the Block M area um, in the background there covered in a bank of screen. So this figure shows the evidence for activity that predates the time when the area was used for burial. The earliest evidence of any note was a small area of plough scarring in the northwest corner of the site, 
which are separated from later activity by a plough soil containing pottery with a date range of 1st to 2nd century AD. Above this was a deposit with a high gravel content, possibly some sort of ground consolidation or a rough surface. Given that its position was probably close to the outer Roman defensive ditch, this might have been some kind of trackway. These layers were only found on the Block M site um, and the Air media studies site didn't extend quite far enough for them to be actually shown in it. So it's possible that some of the features found on that part of the site could also belong to this period. Above the gravel layer was a small circular structure with associated gravel surfaces to the south and a hearth and a pit containing ashy pit material. Dating for this early period is not precise, but a dark soil above, described as an occupation layer, contained numerous finds, including metalwork, stamped pottery and stamp pottery, which indicate a 1st to 2nd century date. The function of this structure is not clear. It was about five metres in diameter. It may have been a dwelling or an ancillary building. Either way, it's good ev evidence that the area beyond the fort or town walls was utilised before the first graves were dug. As I said earlier, dating for this period is not precise, and it's possible that the building, along with other early features, are contemporary and possibly related to the kilns first discovered in the 1960s. At the time, these were dated to the late 1st to the early 2nd century. The location of the kilns was re-examined in the media studies excavations and I'll show their locations in the next image. These have been partially excavated in the 60s and further damaged by, the, by later construction. So when we came to re-examine them, not much evidence remained. We sent a, a sample of charcoal for radiocarbon dating, but the date range, which spanned from the late 1st to the early 3rd centuries, confirmed but didn't refine the date range that they were in operation. However, we did find more pottery wasters from misfired pottery, which adds to the evidence from the 1960s. In the last phase of activity before the area became a graveyard, it, it is apparent that the area was farmed for a while with ditches dug to demarcate fields and enclosures. The building must have gone out of use and been demolished by this period because it was overlain by another band of gravel rich soil, which was bounded on its eastern side by a ditch that probably separated this area close to the town, to the, close to the town from the farmland to the east. A thick build up of soils here are probably the result of cultivation but there were indications that the ground was also quite wet and a lot of these ditches were re-established over a period of time, um, no doubt as they silted up. One feature from this period that's worth pointing out is the stone-lined well, which is down on the <laughs> left, whoa, on that side of the uh, site. Um, this feature was later used to deposit a human skeleton after it had been passed. So to the cemetery. As with the duration of the previous activity, dating the establishment of the graveyard is somewhat unclear. A thick blanket of soil covered most of the earlier deposits and it was into this that the graves were cut. This deposit produced a lot of pottery, some diagnostic pieces of metalwork and even coins, but it was obvious that a lot of this material was residual and may have been derived from reworking the layers below or manuring the fields and generally using the area as a place to throw stuff away. Much of this material must have derived from the town itself and contained tessera fragments, fragments of opsig, that's a type of flooring, and ceramic tile and animal bone with butchery cuts. Dating from this material suggests that the area probably continued to be used to dump waste even after the burials began. All the known burials are shown here, counting the earlier excavations, which are the uh, graves shown in yellow. A total of approximately 241 burials have been recorded. Only four of these burials were cremations. The rest were inhumations. Preservation of the bone was good, with no wood or organic material surviving. 
However, conditions on site were challenging to say the least. There were some dry spells during the media studies excavations when the soil baked concre to concrete, but on the Block M excavations, the conditions were mostly dire. So all praise to the excavators, it really was very wet indeed. No doubt a considerable number of burials have been removed by later truncation, particularly cremations and shallower graves. There's certainly evidence for some order in the burials in some places, but also intercutting of burials. So there appear to be times when the burial, was, the burial ground was managed and some episodes when burial was more ad hoc. It's difficult to draw conclusions given the patchy survival, but it would appear that the central air, in the central area there are some orderly rows of burials. Grave markers, if they existed, did not survive. There are only two post holes which may represent the settings for posts. There are two prevailing alignments, either parallel to the road or at right angles, while the heads in either of those alignments were placed at either end. There was quite a wide variety of burial practices. Most burials were supine or face up, but some were prone, others on their side, and a few decapitated with heads lying near the feet. There was evidence that some, but not all, had been buried in coffins. This shows two burials, one later than the other, but presumably deliberately buried into the same grave. But on the right hand side of the photo, you can see the legs of an earlier burial on a different alignment cut by this later grave. There were also two wells with articulated human remains. In both instances, the burials had gone in after the wells had been partially backfilled. We can only speculate as to how or why they got there. Grave goods in the burial ground in general were not common, with some notable exceptions, but there were several examples of burials with hobnail boots, and you'll see images of this in Philippa's talk to follow. There is one contemporary feature worth pointing out. Close to the cluster of three cremations and with another cut into its ditch is a low mound about four metres wide and no more than 50 centimetres high and I've circled it in purple. If there was a central burial it didn't survive. It sealed earlier pits containing Roman pottery and it had a Roman cremation deposited in the surrounding ditch so we're pretty certain that it's Roman in date. If it was an earthen burial mound, it's quite a rare example for Britain and unusual for being in an urban rather than a military setting. Other examples are mostly from military sites such as High Rochester and South Shields, and there are 10 recorded from a site in Colchester. The tradition is thought to be Germanic in origin. Pottery, metalwork and worked bone objects mostly found as accidental inclusions in graves suggest the cemetery was in most frequently used in the second to fourth century. A number of radiate coins datable to 260 to 290 and one example of a coin dated to the early fourth century were placed in the mouths of the dead to ensure passage to the afterlife, reflecting a custom thought to be prevalent in the late third century to early fourth centuries in Britain. The burial of hobnail boots at the foot of the grave is also a late Roman custom. Unfortunately, radiocarbon dates from this period give a very wide date range and so are not as helpful as they could be in pinning down the date in which the cemetery was in use. Four burials and a cremation from the Media Studies site returned to dates which were consistent with a 3rd to 4th century dating from the finds and burial customs. However, the body from the well returned a date of 263 to 534 AD, and there were hints of later activity from a number of finds, including a jet bracelet and a worked bone pin. When the Block M excavations took place, these hints of 5th century activity took a more solid form with the excavation of grave 1874 one of an orderly row of graves found at the southwesterly edge of the excavated area. You will hear more about this grave in the following talks. This was an adult male buried with dress accessories, including a brooch and a belt buckle, 
but strongly suggest an early to mid 5th century date. Um, I've circled here the brooch at the shoulder um, and the belt buckle and a knife um, by his other side. This was a really exciting discovery and to further explore the possibility that our cemetery held some late, possibly post-Roman burials, we submitted a sample of bone for radiocarbon dating, along with human bone from three other burials in the same row. Frustratingly, the results were held up for many months due to lab closures during the corona pandemic and have only recently um, arrived. Even more frustrating was the fact that although three of the samples were successful and provided dates of 3rd to 4th century for the graves, the grave with the interesting assemblage of grave goods failed. Very disappointing, possibly related to the waterlogged conditions. Anyway, we've asked the lab at Bristol to do another test and we are waiting for the results. And now to the post-burial archaeology. A rectangular timber building located at the western corner of the site survived as foundation trenches. The relationship between this building and the layer seeding the cemetery did not survive in this area, so it is possible that the building was contemporary with the cemetery rather than being of later date. And it's notable in this respect that it didn't overlie or cut any graves. Um, and the building was cut uh, above by several medieval ditches. The only pottery recovered from the foundation trenches was of Roman date, that's mid third century or later. Apart from the timber structure, there was very little physical ev activity, evidence for activity surviving the site from the period between the cemetery and the period after the Norman conquest. But there was at least one feature and a number of pieces of metalwork and worked bone in Saxon styles as well as a sherd of organic tempered pottery, probably 7th to 8th century in date. However, these finds were all found in unstratified or in residual contexts in later features. The feature here has all the characteristics of a sunken featured building, apart from the central post holes, which may have been truncated by the later ditch, which you can see as a dark stripe running through the central area. You probably all know what a sunken feature building is, but if you don't, it's a characteristic building style of the Saxon period, constructed of timber, probably with a suspended timber floor over this central cavity that you can see here, and with a pitched roof. This very early activity was partially sealed by about 50 centimetres of soil or dark earth. It was cut by medieval pits and ditches, and produced Roman pottery alongside sherds of the 12th to 14th centuries. We're not sure of its exact origins, but it may in part represent a development of the Roman graveyard soil, along with organic material and other waste imported into the site during the medieval period. The ditches laid out in this period are likely to be demarcations of burgage plots, and we can envisage that by this time, there were a number of small crofts built alongside the road. The boundary ditch running at the southeastern edge of the site was deep, a deep and substantial ditch that had been redug many times over. One last really interesting discovery was this post built building up at the uh, top um, northeast side of the site. It predates some of the Burgage ditches and was contemporary with others. The post holes were massive and were only distinguishable from some equally enormous pits seen here to the west of the building by the presence of a post pipe, which was visible in some of them. The post holes described the end of a bow ended building or apsidal with two rows of even larger post holes within. Post pipes suggest that post diameter of 80 centimetres for the outer walls and 1.25 metres diameter for the inner ones. This construction suggests an old building, which judging by the size of the post holes would have been a very imposing structure. A large deposit of medieval roof tile found to the east is probably from the roof. Um, I haven't had a chance to properly research this building yet. I know of one very large post and sill beam building from Ely in Cambridgeshire of similar size and date, 
but I would be very happy to hear from anyone who has excavated something similar to the one we've got here. So that's it. Um, I just wanted to show you a nice basement floor from a 19th century building which survived up until the demolition in the 1960s when the Media Studies College building was erected. That's all I've got to say. I've really enjoyed telling you about the site and some of the other significant discoveries we've made from both before and after the site was used as a graveyard. And now I'll hand you over to Sharon Clough who will tell you more about those burials. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Mary. What a sight. What an account of that. Some fantastic archaeology. And I think fully bears out Andrew's point that there's an awful lot to find underneath some of these places that were built on during the 1960s, which do allow us to go back and have a look. Well, it's the cemetery phases that we're going to focus on for the next couple of talks, and we're going to move on now to Sharon Clough. Um, Sharon is uh, Cotswold Archaeologist Senior Environmental Officer. She joined us in 2016, having previously worked as a freelance working on human bone collections from a variety of sites. She's currently the chair of the Chartered Institute for Archaeologist Osteology and Special Interest Group, and uh, she may be familiar to some of you because she's appeared on Channel 4's Bone Detectives last year in connection with the work at the Medieval Execution Cemetery down at Wayhill near Andover. But her title for today is Exploring the High Level of Trauma Amongst the Skeletal Remains. Sharon, take it away. Hi, my name is Sharon Clough and I'm Cotswold Archaeology's osteoarchaeologist. I've been analysing human remains for about 20 years now and in that time I've analysed quite a number of different Roman period assemblages. Uh, one of those was a very large site from Lang Hills just outside Winchester and a bit closer to this site just down London Road, the Wooden Cemetery, uh, which is the part that was excavated by Foundations Archaeology. For the current site, um, I analysed the area known as Block M and uh, Anne-Sophie Whitkin looked at the area known as Media Studies and I'm going to use some of her results uh, in the talk today. I want to talk to you about one aspect of this analysis, which is the high level of trauma that's been exhibited amongst the skeletal remains and in particular the cranial trauma. I'm going to suggest that this is possibly evidence for retired soldiers. Now, I'm just going to say the following slides obviously do have images of skeletal remains. So here we have the plan of the cemetery, which you've seen previously, and it was excavated in three phases, which I'm sure you already know. The yellow ones are the excavations that took place in 1966, 67, and we got about 37 individuals from that, that time. These are currently created at Exeter University and not a lot of work has been done on them up to date. So I don't have a huge amount of results from those. And then Cotswold Archaeology then excavated the area known as Media Studies in 2013 to 2014, and we got about 153 individuals from that area. And then more recently, in 2016, 2017, the Block M area appeared to the north. That was, um, the result of that was 57 uh, skeletal remains. So in total, there's been about 247 individuals excavated from this cemetery. Now, obviously, there's been a lot of truncation over the years, and um, it's not the entire cemetery. So what we have is sort of a snapshot of the population. But it's a good area and quite a large number to try and get some ideas about what's going on in the population um, and any patterning. So what I'm going to say today is about the adults that we um, recovered. The one from Block M, that were nearly all adults with 48 of them. Um, and what became immediately and obvious in the analysis was that we had a very high number of male individuals in amongst the adults, so 81%, which is a huge amount, with only 19% female. So this, normally you'd expect in a traditional cemetery, you know, roughly 50-50, maybe, male to female. So we wondered, is that just because it's just that little area, maybe there were just more men buried in that part of the cemetery? So <clears throat> then had a look at the media studies results. And there was a similar discrepancy with a 65% male to 29% female. So this suggests that there is an imbalance uh, of men to women in these that are being buried in this cemetery. Now, we do know in that a lot of Roman period cemeteries have an imbalance. There's usually a lot more men than women, but the imbalance isn't usually quite so dramatic 
it's more sort of 1.7 or 2 to 1. So what is going on here? Um, so we also had a look at the age distribution. In the block M area, the 26 to 35 year olds, those in the prime of their lives, they were 21%, which is almost exactly the same number as the 46 plus, which was 22%. Now, because of the nature of osteological ageing, these are always estimates of age, and we can't actually age people over the age of four, about 45, all the way up to 100. They all come out in the same big humongous block. Uh, so we can't actually tease out any more uh, inference from this. But what you would normally expect in an age distribution is like this graph that I have on the uh, right there. Normally you'd expect a high number of neonates to die. And then gradually uh, as time goes on and slight increase. And so you should expect the majority of your population at normal attritional cemetery to be in this older age bracket. You would not expect to have exactly the same number in the prime category as you do in the older age category. So I thought, oh, is this just the block M? No, it's exactly the same in the media studies as well. So there's definitely something going on here where we have um, a population that's been buried in the cemetery that are predominantly male and a high number in the prime of their lives in the 26 to 35 category, which is the same number that's dying, say, in the older age category. So this immediately strikes you as there's something a bit different here. This isn't what we would normally expect. So moving on to the trauma that I discussed at the beginning. When we talk about trauma in, in osteology, we talk about normally healed trauma. So that's um, assaults on the skeleton, which have resulted in healed fractures from uh, also damage to the soft tissue, which results in ossified soft um, tissue, which you can see is sort of extra bone growth on the skeleton. And you also see it as secondary joint disease. So there's been some sort of trauma or injury and the result of the person living long term is they've developed joint disease in that area. Obviously, we're going to talk about the cranial trauma. This is a bit more unusual. Um, assaults to the, the, to the head are usually from interpersonal violence, but not always. They can obviously be from accidents as well. And amongst this population, we have at least three healed cranial traumas. Um, there are potentially some more, but I'm just going to discuss these particular three today. So the first individual that I'm going to show you is skeleton 1567. And they are located here on the plan. And you can see the little tiny yellow skeleton pop up there on the right. And this is them lying in the ground. So they've got the left arm bent over the chest. They're on their back or supine. The grave has cut through an early grave when the head has then got redeposited in the backfill. And it looks like a fairly normal burial uh, to all intents and purposes. Now, I know it's very difficult on a small screen, but there's a little tiny black oval there, which I'm going to show you a, a bit bigger. So this is the skull of SK 1567, and you can immediately see that there is a very large wound here on the left frontal bone. There's also sort of some sort of linear sort of thing going on here on the frontal bone. And then just at the back there, which I'll show you here, there's another smaller wound. So skeletons 1567 was a male aged about 35 to 45. So that's what we call mature adults. And as you can see, has got three different cranial traumas on the same, uh, which obviously haven't happened at the same time because two of them are healed. And one of them is what we call perimortem. That means at or around the time of death. Having a look at the largest wound here, it's very large. We wouldn't expect normally something quite so, so wide and it's deep. It penetrates into the endocranium. So we, the result of that would have been maybe some internal bleeding. There's a chance of infection getting in. And it's a complete testament to the Roman medical care at the time that this individual then survived that wound and it's healed and they've lived with it for some time afterwards. The smaller one there, uh, again, it's quite quite severe, you know, that's not just an accidental um, sort of graze. It doesn't penetrate into the endocranium, but again, it has healed. What we don't know, unfortunately, is whether these two incidents were at the same time or they were at separate occurrences. 
The linear striation that we seem to have here, this is probably caused by some sort of sword or blade. It's got radiating fracture lines from the impact and there's no sign of healing. So as I say, this is probably around the time of death, whether they live, you know, died straight away or live for a few days afterwards, we can't say, but it definitely uh, shows no sign of healing at all. The blow must have been really quite severe because there are some enamel chips on the teeth where the mouth has been forced together. And then there's also an incomplete fracture to the anterior arch of the atlas vertebra, which is the very, very top on the, the, the spine. And these are usually caused by some sort of axial loading force. So a force directly through the top of the head. So clearly this is what finished them off. But they'd obviously been in lots of other incidents before that final blow. So it's pretty unusual to have a skull like this in a cemetery uh, showing multiple injuries. Um, so that's, you know, it was pretty exciting to find. However, we didn't just have one, <laughs> um, we had more than one. So here we have skeleton 1519 and he's located here. Now, if anybody remembers from the previous plan, it's actually right next door to the first skeleton I just showed you. So this is 16, 1567 here. And 1519 is actually just located, well, it's been taken out before the person stood in the grave. And here he is. He's actually lying prone, which is face down, with the arms drawn up towards the face. Um, prone is a position you see quite frequently in Roman period burials. Um, I wouldn't say it's unusual. You don't get a lot of them, but you do expect to find them. We're not 100% sure why people are buried prone. There seems to be no patterning to it. It happens to all age groups. It happens to men, women and children. Um, and so, you know, I wouldn't sort of necessarily take anything away from the body position in this case in particular. So as I said, it was another male individual, this time a bit younger. He was 25 to 35, so in that prime age category. And he's got two healed cranial traumas on his head. So you've got a linear here and a slightly more irregular one here. And you can see them better in this view. Again, they're very deep. This one is penetrating to the endocranium again. And as I said, they're both healed. So we can't tell whether, again, they occurred at the same time, the same incident, or they occurred at separate occasions. But it's pretty unusual to have such injuries on somebody's cranium, and they're highly unlikely to be accidental, especially given the position. There were no perimortem injuries this time in this individual, uh, and this is all that they had. So we don't really know what they died of, but we do know that they died quite young. So as I said at the beginning, we have three cranial traumas, and this is our third individual. This is in the Media Studies area, and this is SK6202, located here. And you can see the little skeleton there has popped up. So he's a bit further away from the other individuals, and sadly when we found him, he was truncated through the middle, but we have got the important bits of the uh, skeleton, so we can tell uh, some information about him. And this is the cranium. And it's immediately obvious that there's an extremely large healed cranial trauma here on the head. And again, it looks quite similar to that first one from 1567. It's deep, it's penetrating into the endocranium, but it is extremely well healed. This individual again was a mature adult male like the first one, 35 to 45 years when they died. Um, and again, no indication of what actually, there's no perimortem trauma indication of what actually killed them in the end, but they've lived with this wound for some time. So we've got three different cranial traumas, which actually look like they may have been caused by a sort of similar method um, in, in two of the cases. The, obviously that first one and the second one, more healed ones are all linear. So again, we're looking at some sort of maybe bladed instrument. Um, and so I started to have a look around at other cemeteries to see if you know anybody else had any injuries like this. Um, and I came across one, from not too far away from here, um, a site called South of the Foss Way, just outside of Sirencester. And this was excavated in the 70s, um, and the osteology was done by a quite famous osteologist called Calvin Wells, just before he died in 1978. 
And you can see there on the injury um, across, across the frontal bone, it's almost identical to the perimortem one that we had on 1567, which is really exciting. And then you've got another injury, which he calls a slingshot wound onto the side of the frontal bone, although it looks a little bit smaller. It does look quite similar to some of those injuries that we've got on those three individuals. So it's quite nice and refreshing. This is also dates to the Rome period. He also suggested that these are possibly individuals from the military. Although Calvin Wells, he's quite notorious for his more interesting interpretations of his uh, skeletons that he examined. Um, but you never know, he might have been right in this case. I also had a look around at some of the other cemeteries from across the country. We have some quite famous ones, the Gladiators uh, in York at Driffield Terrace. But their injuries, so they had a number of cranial injuries, but they weren't quite as deep or similar. There's also some sites in London, some from Rome period cemeteries there. And again, there's a number of injuries, but they're not sort of obviously caused by the same and they're not as extensive um, in their healing. So, you know, we're looking at something that's going on particularly and maybe in these just these two areas, maybe caused by the same sort of implements. So we also have some evidence from graves where we haven't necessarily got cranial trauma, but we've got some other evidence instead that might suggest some sort of military connection. This is a double burial from the Block M area, which is located here. And it's quite close by to those other two previous cranial injury burials. In fact, it's just across the way from them. And when I say about a double burial, I mean that these two were interred at the same time. You can see that the right arm there is overlapping and then this left arm is underneath the other individual. And they've been interred at the same time, so they probably must have died um, around a similar sort of time together. And it's quite unusual in the Rome period to have a double burial. This is usually everybody has their own individual graves. So for two to be put together like this, it suggests there's some sort of connection between them. And this got us thinking, why? What is it about them? Are they related in some way? Um, one is a male, older adult, over 45. The other is a prime adult, also male, 25 to 35. But unfortunately, you can't tell from looking at the bones whether two people are related or not. So an opportunity for some ancient DNA analysis from a collaboration with the Wright Lab at Harvard Medical School as part of the Commius project that's been run out of York University allowed us to send off a sample to see if we could find out if they were genetically related. Very excitingly, the results came back and it was confirmed that this is a father and a son. This is brilliant news. We just we just don't normally get this information. We can suspect, we can theorise, we can sort of debate, but to actually have it confirmed that they are directly related is fantastic. Although it does throw up more questions. Again, why are they buried together? How come they died at the same time? One possibility someone suggested to me was that quite often sons followed their fathers into the Roman military. Is that what we're seeing here? Have they both died somehow related to that? What was more interesting um, was that the older individual, 1511, um, had quite a number of different injuries on his skeleton. And one of them here you can see in the picture is a healed fracture to the right lower leg. This is the tibia and the fibula, and it's healed of an oblique fracture that's healed with overlapping. So the leg would have been slightly shortened. He hasn't just got that injury, though. He's got a healed nasal fracture, so he, you know, where he's had a broken nose. He's got two right lower side ribs, so around the back, he's had two broken ribs there. He's also got a broken rib right at the front, sort of near the sternum. He's got quite severe osteoarthritis in the left hip. He's also got some feet changes in his toes, his phalanges, which suggests some sort of, you know, repeated activity, quite uh, stress um, creating. And more interestingly, he's got some active infection on both scapula on the back. And the possibility of one of those scapulas might even, it might even be a fracture. So this is an infection which was active at the time of death to the upper back where the skin is quite thin there on, on behind your shoulders. Now that could have occurred through carrying heavy objects, repeatedly rubbing on the skin, exposing it to infection, but it could also have been maybe from beating or whipping or just some sort of direct blunt force trauma, hence the fracture. 
So individuals like this are known as injury recidivists, which means they just have repeated trauma all over their body from lots of different incidents. And it's been suggested that these could be evidence for veteran soldiers. Other evidence can be things like perimortem injuries, asymmetry, so that means two sides aren't quite the same, lots of activity markers, so they've been doing lots of vigorous activity, origins elsewhere in Europe, but sadly, all these indicators could also total up um, and identify the slave. And again, we know that in the Roman period, there are a lot of slaves all over the empire. So, you know, it's quite entirely possible that the older individual with his physical evidence was a retired soldier. And then somehow he died and was buried at the same time as his son. We have a further individual who just adds a little bit more interest to the to the story, and this is SK 1873. You'll probably hear a bit more about this individual later because he's got a really interesting brooch. Now, I'm told this brooch dates to the early 5th century and possibly comes from somewhere in the Low Countries in Europe. So this is quite interesting. He's very late in date. He's got some sort of evidence that suggests European connections. As you can see here in the image, he's got a great big modern pile through the middle of his legs there, which is quite unfortunate, but he, the rest of him is quite well preserved. He was located here on the plan. He was a little further away from some of the others, but not a million miles. And this is a close up of his skull. Now, he doesn't have any of those cranial injuries. He doesn't have any perimortem injuries, but his skull, when I looked at it, he looked a little bit different. When you do osteology, you sort of get your eye in on skeletons. You get to sort of get to sort of familiar with what is normal and typical for that assemblage. And his facial features looked a little bit different to the others. And along with that brooch, we decided that he should also be included in the ancient DNA study. And this came back with some really interesting results. So he came back that his Y chromosome, so that's down the male line, came from haplogroup or I1A2 which probably doesn't mean a lot to most of the people. But um, from this map that you have there on the screen, you can see that the top group, the I1s, tend to come from Northern Europe. And in particular, the I1A2 comes from the Germany, Netherlands, Low Countries region. So this means that either him or his father came from this part of Europe, which happens to coincide with where we think this brooch has come from. So it infers some kind of travel, somebody's moving across, which we know happened a lot in the Roman Empire, there was a lot of movement of people around, and then ended up somehow in Gloucester, dying there. It does infer possible military connections. We know that very late on, there were a lot of what they call the Federati around, and perhaps he's one of these, we just don't know. But it's an exciting, tantalising um, suggestion here with the evidence that we have. So having a look at the location of all these graves to see if there was any sort of zoning, perhaps we're looking at a military area for burial. And the first three you can see there on the screen with the little yellow skeletons popping up is that they're really close together. Then there was one a bit further away and then we have our last person there with the brooch in the middle of a row. So they're not particularly close together but they're not a million miles apart either. And as I say, we are missing quite a lot of information. As you can see, there's a lot of truncation that's happened. I don't have the information from the 1966 burials, which are in yellow. So maybe there's some more uh, yet to be discovered in this cemetery. Um, so are we looking at retired soldiers? Well, what I said before about these injury recidivists, these multiple trauma, we do have evidence for that. Um, we know the Roman army was in Britain. We know that there were colonia. Gloucester was one of them, which is where all the retired soldiers went, were given um, places to go. And we've, they must have died. <laughs> where are they? They've got to be here somewhere. Um, and trying to identify them is quite tricky. But as I said, we are looking for violence related injuries in, in related to their time that they served in the army. We've got several individuals here from one site. This isn't a one off. This is this is more than one person. We have the double burial, which, you know, possibly with his with his multiple injuries and the fact that they're related possibly indicates this. And then we have that late burial with the brooch um, and the ancient DNA suggesting travel. So these are all 
possible evidence for them being retired soldiers. Or in the case of that first individual I showed you, 1567, unfortunately he died from his injury, uh, so I don't think he really got the chance to actually retire. Alternative explanations for these phenomena, they're all accidents, just purely, you know, and in the line of, of whatever they were doing, they just happened to have some quite major head injuries. Um, one of my favourites, gladiators, um, although I really don't think that's what we have here. Evidence for gladiators at other sites, they have more injuries across the body, they have different kinds of injuries, so they're not usually as severe because the whole idea is that they then live to fight another day. Is it just a coincidence that we've got more than one person? Is it just, just the longevity of the use of the cemetery? And it's just a pure coincidence that they've all got buried there, which is entirely possible. But what we do know, though, is that, as I say, we've got 1567 who died from that sort of possible sword injury. And so he must have died somewhere in the local area, which means there's some sort of violence going on. You don't tend to carry dead people very far to bury them. So I've presented just a small part of the analysis of the cemetery today about these individuals. I say there's a, quite a lot of the trauma I could have discussed. They're particularly interesting in lots of ways. There's sort of something going on in the feet that is quite interesting, which, again, I was going to suggest maybe evidence of, of long marching and carrying a heavy pack. So that will all have to wait for another time. But I'm going to leave you to make up your own mind as to whether you think these are retired soldiers or not. And I want to say thank you very much for listening to this talk. Fantastic. Thank you, Sharon. It just goes to show how much detail you can get out of these burials when you start analysing them in the sort of level of analysis that you've been doing there. Just absolutely remarkable. Um, thank you to those who are starting to put questions into the Q&A box. We shall come to those in due course. If you've got a question that's uh, coming to mind, do pop that in the Q&A box. And if you have one of the panel members you'd specially like to address it to, um, just indicate who that person might be as well, and that'll help us sort things out in a few moments. But we've got one final talk before then, and our final speaker is uh, Philippa Walton, who's Cotswold Archaeology's find manage, finds manager. Um, Philippa joined us in 2020, not very long ago. Um, she was previously at the University of Reading, where she was working on and researching ritual and rubbish in Roman rivers, which is a pretty interesting topic. Well, she's got a book coming out in June, which has the truly wonderful title of Bridge Over Troubled Water, the finds and the river tees at Pierce Bridge in context. Well, I don't think you get better than that as a title for a book, so do, do watch out for it. Her title for us today is Of the Living and the Dead, the Roman Finds. Philippa, over to you. Hello, my name is Philippa Walton, and I'm one of the finds managers at Cotswold Archaeology. Now that Mary and Sharon have given an overview of the archaeology and the skeletal remains, my talk will focus on the finds recovered from the excavations on both sides of Brunswick Road. These finds include not only grave goods from the late Roman cemetery, but also much earlier material associated with the development of the Roman military fortress and colonia in Gloucester. These objects should provide a small glimpse into life and death in Roman Gloucester. Before I begin, I'd like to point out that although I'm giving this presentation, I didn't undertake the analysis of the material from these sites. Instead, I'm summarising the excellent research of others. As with many archaeological projects, a range of specialists were involved in identifying, recording and commenting on the significance of the material. They include another of Cotswold's finds managers, Ed McSloy, as well as Martin Haley, Kevin Haywood and Hilary Cool. And so first, we can look at some of the finds from the Greyfriars site, which fell within the defences of the fortress and later Colonia. A single find recovered from the excavations there gives a tantalising glimpse of activity at the site prior to the Roman conquest. It is a bone weaving comb dating to the Iron Age, measuring 134 millimetres in length and 47 millimetres in width. It is a type of find which is relatively common on Iron Age sites in Britain. Large groups have been recovered during excavations at Danebury in Hampshire and the Glastonbury and Mere Lake villages in Somerset. 
There seems to be little regional variation in their style and decoration, as similar examples have been found as far afield as Mildon Hall in Suffolk. There is much debate about exactly how these combs were used during the weaving process. Although most theories agree that they were employed as beaters, they are also likely to be multifunctional in nature. The example from our site at Greyfires has clear signs of wear and polish on the teeth. The weaving comb is an isolated Iron Age of survival. However, there are far more finds which appear to relate to the occupation of the legionary fortress established at the site in the AD 60s. Unfortunately, these were not found in first century contexts. Instead, most of the finds come from later Roman levelling or rampart deposits, although their presence clearly attests to first century military activity in this area. The objects include various items of military equipment. On the left, you can see part of a Roman military belt buckle dating to the first century AD. And there's also a sword handguard with a similar date range. Sword handguards of this form would be suitable for the short gladius infantry sword or the longer cavalry spatha. Similar finds from Britain are uncommon, although there is a good parallel for this example from London. Other finds include a copper alloy hinge strap fitting from segmented armour known today as Lorica segmentata. They date to the period AD 40 to 140 and are primarily, but not necessarily exclusively, associated with legionary troops. Such fittings are the parts of armour most frequently found in the archaeological record and indicate the fragility of the design of Lorica segmentata. And finally, on the right is the hooked sheath fitting from a military pickaxe or delabra. The delabra was used for breaking ground when digging ditches, clearing scrub, and sometimes even fighting. Similar sheaths used to protect the blade have been found during excavations of other first century military sites, including nearby Kingsholm in Gloucester. There are also several other objects, while not actually military equipment, have clear associations with the Roman army. The first of these is this elaborately decorated lid from an inkwell with silver inlay. Known as a null type, inkwells like this are rare finds with only 46 examples known from throughout the Roman Empire. Most of these examples come from the northern provinces and Italy. Literacy in the early Roman period is unlikely to have been widespread and the rarity and quality of objects such as this indicate that their use was almost certainly restricted to richer households, high-ranking officials and the higher echelons of the military. This also appears to be reflected in the fine spots of null inkwells, which are concentrated at military sites and larger towns. A date range in the final quarter of the first century and into the early part of the second century seems certain from better dated examples. This lid was discovered in one of the makeup layers within a house structure, and although dating to the first or early second century AD, it was found alongside third and fourth century pottery. It's therefore possible that it re represents a curated heirloom. Another object with Roman military associations is this iron hanging lamp. Although it's very corroded, iron lamps do not usually survive complete, and so its state of preservation is exceptional. Again, it's likely to be early Roman in date, although it was found in a post-Roman rubble layer. It's similar to lamps which were found at the Fort of Newstead and to examples found in second century graves in southern Britain. In the northeastern part of the excavation area at Greyfires, several unusual objects and a partial cattle skull were recovered from layers within the ramparts. This raises the possibility that they were deliberately placed there during construction, perhaps as votive deposits. One of the objects included in, this, in these deposits was a miniature stone altar. The uninscribed altar is made of Painswick stone and measures 156 millimetres in height. It was boldly cut but had simple mouldings, 
three at the top and three at the bottom, and would seem to have rested on short lugs, one of which remains, lifting it clear of the ground or more probably the shelf on which it sat. There is a cut circular focus on the upper face rising towards the centre, which is marked by a compass point. On one side, just below the moulding, there are carvings of a sacrificial knife, a pole axe, and below them, a patera. Small altars such as this were most probably associated with private cults, and may, this one may have belonged to a soldier stationed in the fortress. Similar examples have been found at other Roman military installations in Britain, including the Classis Britannica Fort at Dover. Found with the altar was this copper alloy wing, perhaps belonging to a statue of an eagle or the Roman personification of victory, Victoria. No complete statuette of Victoria has survived from Roman Britain. However, a full-size statue from Brescia in Northern Italy shows Victoria with wings held in a similar falling attitude, signing the record of victory on a shield. The detailed modeling of the wing is suggestive of a Flavian date, and it's tempting to see the bronze being in some way related to the end of the fortress at Gloucester and its conversion into a colonia. Figures of victory would have been much in evidence in important Roman military installations and in their successor cities. On the other side of Brunswick Road, Cotswold archaeology excavated a further two sites which lay outside the Roman fortress and later Colonia. And I will now turn to some of the finds recovered from these excavations. The earliest evidence for Roman activity dates to the later 1st and 2nd centuries AD and included enclosures, trackways, two pottery kilns and the remains of what appears to be a smithy. Associated with the smithy were numerous items of metalworking waste and broken copper alloy artefacts. Some were first century in date and military in origin. They include harness fittings and pendants, as well as elements of lorica segmentata armour. Others are personal items like this incomplete Polden Hill brooch or this fragment of penannular brooch. They all most likely represent scrap collected for repair or recycling. There is little evidence for any further activity at the site until the late second or early third century AD, when it became a large Roman cemetery. The burials were mostly in wooden coffins, but very few were associated with grave goods. The scarcity of grave goods contrasts with a number of other Romano-British cemeteries, but finds comparison with certain poorer sandwiches, such as Bathgate in Cirencester and Butt Road in Colchester. It's very likely to indicate something about the social status of those buried there. The date range of finds recovered suggests that the cemetery was in use from the mid third century AD until at least the early fifth century AD. If nothing else, the occupants of the cemetery do seem to have been buried with their shoes. The most common grave goods seen in the cemetery was hobnailed footwear. This was an established part of the late Roman burial rite. Some individuals were clearly, clearly interred wearing footwear, like the example on the right, while in other burials, the footwear was placed next to the body, presumably for use in the next life. 14 burials across the cemetery contained Roman coins. The most common coins deposited were coins contemporary with the date of the burial, like this 4th century numus in the top left. It was found in the mouth of a male aged between 25 and 35 years old and was presumably intended as payment to cross into the underworld. However, some burials contain much earlier coins like the Cistercius of Commodus and Ass of Vespasian. Although this might suggest an earlier date for the burials, the ass of Aspasian was found in a grave with a fragment of a glass cup dating to the fourth century. The coin was clearly a curated object, which may have had some significance to its owner or those who placed it in the grave. Very few of the burials were accompanied by any jewellery, with only three yielding strings of beads and another three bracelets. The most elaborate assemblage of beads came from the burial of a female aged 35 to 45. 
Close to the head and neck of the skeleton were 20 jet beads, as well as, of, as well as examples in amber and glass. Tiny splinters of opaque turquoise glass were also recovered, and these were possibly also from another type of bead. Some of the jet beads were of a type known from York, where they were used as elaborate wrist ornaments or were found in large string suspending pendants. It seems that here they may have been reused, along with the glass beads and amber from the Baltic, to create a complete bead string necklace using an unusual combination of beads. Other grave goods found include these two bone combs, both from the burials of young adult females dating to the mid to late 4th century AD. Bone combs have been found as grave goods in a number of large late Roman cemeteries in Britain, and they're usually found in female graves. However, they're not common finds at all, and very few examples have been found in the area of Gloucester. A further three burials were accompanied by bracelets. Although we tend to think of bracelets as being items of female personal adornment, three bone bracelets were found at the wrist of a male aged between 36 and 45. The bracelets were undecorated, but possessed terminals wrapped in copper alloy or iron collars. Similar bracelets have been found as grave goods at Poundbury in Dorset and Lankhills, Winchester dated to the 4th century AD. Although the cemetery produced a relatively small number of grave goods and seems to have served a poor population, there is at least one standout burial, that of an adult male. Part of an alignment of at least 10 graves, it combines elements of late Roman material culture, such as the hobnailed footwear, with intrusive post-Roman traditions. The individual wore a brooch on his right shoulder, had a belt buckle at his waist, and a knife sitting beside his left hip. He was also wearing hobnailed footwear. The copper alloy brooch dates the burial to the mid 5th century AD and provides evidence for continued use of the cemetery well into the 5th century. It is of a type rarely found in Britain and can be identified as a Stutzarm Fibern or supporting arm type. Although similar in style to late Roman crossbow brooches, it is continental in origin and was probably made somewhere in Northwest Germany or the Netherlands. It is possible that it was the possession of a North European immigrant present in Britain in the period immediately following the end of Roman authority. And he could possibly have been a mercenary. Further evidence for the presence of such mercenaries in late or post-Roman Gloucester has been recovered, most notably at the King's Home Cemetery, where a man known as the Gloucester Goth in his 30s or 40s had been buried in a mausoleum with Eastern European belts and other fittings. Isotope analysis revealed that he originated from the area of Hungary, Western Romania or Eastern Poland, and he is interpreted as having been a soldier buried at Gloucester in the 5th century. The presence of an iron knife and a buckle also marks out this burial as unusual in the context of Roman burials in the cemetery. Knives essentially of this form are known from throughout the Roman period, although its breadth is closer to knives found in Anglo-Saxon assemblages, while the buckle is of the type known from early Anglo-Saxon assemblages in Eastern England spanning the 4th and 6th centuries. And that's really where I want to end. I hope this brief overview of the finds from the excavations has illustrated the ways in which objects can provide some insights into life and death in Roman Gloucester. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Great, thanks, Philippa. That was absolutely amazing. Some fantastic finds, as well as uh, the remains that we were talking about earlier on. Now, lots of people have put some questions in the box and uh, you can now see, I hope our panelists are on the screen to answer some of these. Um, I'm gonna have to pick and choose because there's quite a lot coming in. We'll try and spread them around. Um, I'm gonna start with one from Dean, which I think is probably addressed to, to Sharon, which is uh, what would have been the reasons or circumstances around decapitation with the head placed at the feet of a Roman burial 
in the period that we're talking about here. I think you showed us, or somebody, maybe Mary showed us a slide with that on. But uh, Sharon, are you able to help us a bit with that one? Yes, that, that's fine. Yeah, we find a lot of decapitation burials um, in Roman cemeteries. It's quite common to find a few of them have been decapitated and it seems to happen to men, women and even children. We're not 100% sure why people are actually doing this in the Roman period. It seems to be occurring after death most of the time. There was a study, uh, someone did their PhD on this topic um, and didn't really come to a sort of great conclusion, but it does seem to be a rite that is, as I say, undertaken after death for some particular reason. Maybe they're sort of slightly worried about the, the person, you know, coming back um, again, or it's just some extra additional thing that, that, that they need to take uh, care of that person for some reason. Um, but yeah, nobody really knows why, and as I say, there are potentially lots of different reasons for it. Excellent, that's good. Hope that helps a little bit. Um... Mary, you, you showed some pictures of the of the wells, and we've got a couple of questions about wells. They're wondering, for example, whether some of the burials and bones that were found in the wells could be sacrifices of one sort or another. Is that a common theme that you've seen elsewhere? Uh, you'll have to put your microphone on, Mary. Sorry. But... Yeah. Yes. Um, I I I think it, I I. I'm not sure how often it happens actually, um, but, and I like the fact that I was being regarded as having an educated guess, but um, it, it, to us, it speaks of, uh, of less care of that individual, but we are looking at it from our point of view and not from the Roman point of view. Um, uh, likewise, we would think decapitation is a, is a um, something that you do to somebody that you don't like, but we don't know that. Um, in, in that Roman period, people might have thought very differently, but it does speak of people who, for whom people cared less, I guess, or, or wished to um, somehow treat them badly because of something that they'd done during life. But I couldn't say any more than that, really. That, that's jolly useful. Um, that's OK. Um, Andrew, let's just go slightly broadly, just to set this in context a little bit. We've got a question from Alex asking us, would you say that the Barton Cemetery, which we've been talking about, was very different in nature to those outside the walls at King's Holm and up at Coppice Corner? These are big cemeteries that have been investigated in the past, of course. Have you got any insights into that from, from your work as the city archaeologist? I think the Barton Cemetery is different, but part of the thing that makes me hesitate is a lot of the cemeteries further north towards Kingsholm and elsewhere um, haven't been subject to this level of analysis that um, this most recent investigation has, has been. And equally, um, a lot of the sites further north uh, haven't been published, unfortunately. A lot of the archaeological work done um, on the, the larger cemetery sites done in the, the 70s and 80s um, still hasn't gone through full post-excavation publication, uh, which is a great shame. But um, what I do know is if you go around to, to, to the southwest so that you're um, in the area of Parliament Street towards Southgate Street, um, there are further burials there that might be uh, part of the same cemetery or, or, a, or a very nearby Roman cemetery. And those burials seem to be... Um, the, first, there seem to be a higher proportion of females, and secondly, that it seems to be a more high status set of burials. There's more accompanied, um, there's more burials being buried with artifacts. There's um, people seem to be in better physical condition. So it may well be that there are there are um, fashions or social selection in burial going on that we're only just starting to understand. Um, what I would hope is that we can uh, in future get some of the, the King's Holm cemeteries properly analysed and published and written up because I, we have archives at the moment with lots of um, osteo osteological reports and half-finished assessments of human remains and it would be brilliant to get some of those properly looked at and finished off and it's on my very long list of things to do because some of them are clearly going to um, feed into this whole discussion but um, I, I think what, what we <laughs> What we'd need, although I, I really don't want it to happen because it's contrary to my job, is is more big open area excavations of cemeteries around Gloucester. Then we'd have a wider data set. But it would be better to um, to 
finish what we've done in the in the 70s and 80s elsewhere in the city. Um, the only other really big set of human remains found in Gloucester in recent years is up at Wooden Road, and that's a uh, that was a, basically a plague pit excavated by Oxford Archaeology, I think, in 2004, and that's obviously not going to be representative. It's not going to give us the same sort of data we'd get from a normal cemetery. So. Um, I haven't answered you very concisely there, oh, Tim. That's but... okay. That's all right. I think I think um, looking at some of the questions on the list here, you may have got one or two takers to come and have a look at some of that backlog material. Um, one of them might be here. Uh, Lisa, you've asked a question which I think uh, we must address to Sharon. Uh, did other individuals show evidence of healed injuries in the lower limbs? Um, Lisa says that her PhD is analysing remains from several late Roman cemeteries in Canterbury. And she's observed quite a few young middle-aged males with healed injuries uh, to the tibia, fibia, and feet. Is, is that something that rings a bell? Yeah. Yes, sadly, obviously I wasn't able to go through all the pathology that we saw on the individuals today. I did show you that lower leg injury. And yes, there were quite a number of other injuries as well, um, particularly to the lower legs and the feet. And there were quite a lot of changes in the feet, which I thought were very interesting. Uh, possibly indicating a lot of heavy use, a lot of wear and tear, which you don't normally see on the feet um, when you're analysing assemblages. The foot bones are usually quite unchanged. Uh, so yes, definitely. Um, yeah, um, you could probably include them in your PhD if you can get to them. <laughs> <laughs> Have a look, get in touch. That's, that's good news, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, now there's a question coming in for, for Philippa here. Um, that wonderful Iron Age uh, comb that you showed right at the beginning of your piece, I mean, it's in such good condition. Do you think that's evidence of Iron Age settlement in the area, or do you think that's something that Roman people have perhaps brought in with them? I think it's probably some elusive evidence for Iron Age settlement, although there isn't a great deal in Gloucester, I believe, in terms of material culture. Andrew might be able to um, correct me. Um, I'm still waiting to hear, hear from the, the pottery assemblage report for the, the, the Greyfriars site, which I think did have some Iron Age pottery in it. But, so uh, I think I there know. probably is some Iron Age occupation on the site. Um, yeah. We think so, which is quite yeah. exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and indeed, Gloucester, like many cities, I'm just casting my mind back to when I did some work there, there, there is some prehistoric settlement around this and Neolithic pits, for example, underneath Gloucester as well. So yeah, we always have to remember, it's nice that Mary covered that, that early period in the, the pre, pre-Roman layers too. So that's good. Uh, now, Sammy, a question coming in for Sharon, I think, uh, a simple one. Was TB ever found in the bones that you looked at? I did have one individual, a, a female, who had a lot of uh, infection in the ribs um, and some other areas which you know, is potentially evidence of, of tuberculosis. There are also some changes in the spine. The problem about osteology is you can never always be 100% sure about your diagnosis, but I would like to say that there was quite a lot of the classic symptoms of TB in that individual. There was just the one, though, um, from the Block M assemblage. Uh, it's not as common in the Roman period as in tuberculosis. You expect to find it a lot more in later periods. Yeah, that's, that's useful. Um, now, there's a couple of questions coming in which we can probably quickly deal with, because I think that was mentioned during the talk, actually. Uh, one was, what about these 1960s burials? Well, the way they were marked on Mary's map, it did slightly give the impression that they were burials from the 1960s, but it's not. They're burials that were found in the 1960s, but of course, they're much earlier in date. So don't imagine that there's there's some great crock of 1960s individuals been, uh, been put in the grave there, especially as we know what happened in the area around about. So that one's there. Uh, where are they? I think, uh, again, I think Mary mentioned the fact that they're in Exeter. Is that what you said, Mary, when you were talking about where they were? The 1960s burials I'm not quite sure actually we we sent some of our own burials to oh. to Exeter for um to be uh, used as a, a study assemblage um oh. a, 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 as a loan from the Gloucester Museum and they will go back at some time um but I'm I'm afraid I don't know actually Andrew might know I don't know where those ones are yeah well um they they would have gone back to um, the, the Museum of Gloucester, and the Museum of Gloucester tends not to curate human remains in-house. It tends to, to loan them to universities. So they will be um, in one of the, the university archaeology departments will be storing them. 
and um, I would have to go away and find out, but they will be being properly curated. And, and I must admit that it, it does prompt me to think that, of course, a, a research project to review those those remains in the context of this work is would be a very sensible idea. And I can add that can to I my, just... my can I just interrupt to say, <laughs> <laughs> they, they are being curated at Exeter University and um, there is a, a plan in place, a, a project to re-examine those, those remains as well as looking at the evidence that we've got as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's all in hand, don't worry. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> You're perfectly right, Andrew. They're spread around universities, and now we've got quite a lot in Bournemouth, and our um, paleopathology people look at them, and, and I suspect Laura Evis is looking at them down in Exeter as well as, as part of that. So that's good. Now, uh, Dragos has got a question, which I think is for Sharon as well. Hi, were there any female skeletons displaying traumatic injuries, and were they included in the DNA analysis? Also, are such slingshot type injuries limited to the cranium? So there's, there's sort of two questions in one there. First about the female skeletons yeah. and their injuries and then the question of, of slingshot. Well, as I said in my talk, there weren't as many female uh, skeletons to actually examine. So the few that we did have, no, they didn't have those kind of large wounds, uh, the same level of trauma at all, the much more minor injuries. Um, and as I said, one of them, we, um, I think possibly had tuberculosis. So it was quite, evident that it was a particularly male thing with um, the heavy level of trauma. Um, the other part of the question was about, sorry, I missed the About the slingshots. Was it? The slingshots, yeah. Uh, I showed you all the, the um, really obvious cranial trauma. There were a couple of other skulls, which unfortunately were quite badly fragmented and, and weren't quite as visually exciting. Um, but they also display some kinds of cranial trauma. One of them looks like a very large blunt force injury to the, to the side of the head. Um, but there weren't any other slingshot injuries as such. Um, so, yeah, I've shown you everything we've got. Everything we've got there. That's excellent. Now, there seems to be lots of questions coming in about these burials, Sharon. So there's another one for <laughs> you here, which is uh, from Mark. The scars on the skulls, could they have been the result of Roman surgery? And I suppose we could extend that out to ask, are there any other traces of, of medical practices that you came across? You showed us that healed break, which was nice. Mm. Yeah, well, obviously trepanation has been undertaken. So that's surgical, uh, making a hole in the skull for surgical reasons. That's been undertaken throughout all of sort of medical history. And it did also happen in the Roman period. But those wounds that you saw today are not a bit like what a trepanation would look like. It would be a very different kind of uh, wound, healed wound that you would see on a cranium. So um, definitely that's not really happening there. But obviously anything that's healed on a skeleton suggests that there's been some sort of medical intervention that somebody's you know, had some time to rest. They've had some, some something to help them stop getting infection. So any healed injury on a skeleton is potentially evidence of medical care. That's a good one. Um, somebody asked about the radiocarbon dates, and that's maybe something I can help a little bit with, because these dates do come back with quite large error margins. And um, the dates quoted are, of course, estimates of actual age. That's calendar age. And so they have an age span. The trouble with an age span is it's calculated statistically from the original measurements, and those measurements carry standard deviations. And those deviations can be quite large sometimes for all sorts of um, reasons of, of the way that the sample's processed or indeed the way samples are prepared and the way they survive in the ground. So there's a lot of things which come into play when you start adding together the statistical probabilities. And unfortunately, the Roman period is not especially good in terms of being able to calibrate radiocarbon dates because the curve is rather wiggly at this point and uh, so it's quite tricky uh, to do that. Um, there is some work going on at the moment I know to, to refine the calibration curve for the early medieval and Roman period and that's about to be published if it maybe it's already just come out um, but that might help us tie down some of these dates but it's essentially a statistical problem at the end of the day in taking these, these measurements. Now, I've got quite a complicated question here, which I'm going to throw to the panel as a whole. You might listen to, to what it is and, and think about whether there's some things we can we can say. Perhaps Andrew will kick off on it a bit, although it's, it's addressed to Sharon, but I think it's slightly more wide than that. Um, as the Second Legion's Augusta had left Gloucester before the end of the first century for a new base down in South Wales, the most legionaries were stationed on Hadrian's Wall at the time of the Roman Eastern Cemetery. Why should veterans return in numbers to retire in the city 200 years later? 
An amphitheater hasn't been located in Gloucester, but one would have been likely for a city of this size. We know, of course, there's one in Cirencester. So why is the assumption that the skeletons belong to retired veterans preferred? All sorts of things come into play there. Andrew, kick off, and then perhaps others will want to chip in as well, because there's finds evidence and human remains evidence to take into account here as well, and the site, of course, Mary. Well, it's a very fair comment that the original Colonia was founded um, by, you know, near the end of the first century, so far earlier than than the time of the cemetery, and the majority of the original retired soldiers would have would have been settled in Gloucester then, but. Um, Britain has two or three or even four legions stationed um, at a continuous basis for 200 years. So um, there would have been plenty of soldiers living and retiring in Britain uh, over the next couple of hundred years. And um, Gloucester as a colonial settlement might well have been attractive for, um, for soldiers to retire to even 100 years after its original founding. So um, we can't rule out the soldiers' um, idea but I, I have to say um, quickly segueing into talking about um, amphitheaters we haven't found Gloucester's amphitheater but I'd be amazed if it didn't have one um, a city of its size um, and importance it, it, um, so I wouldn't rule that out either um, I have to say my own personal instinct is that this looks like a fairly low status area of cemetery and it wouldn't surprise me if there were enslaved people buried here uh slaves buried here I, I, you know that they represent a very high proportion of the population and they've got to be buried somewhere as well okay that's good quickly go around the room mary do you have any thoughts on that i have to put your microphone on yeah i know i am <laughs> <laughs> trying to get the cursor there <laughs> yeah no more than um what andrew said really i mean if there was a tradition of uh soldiers retiring to certain towns um that might well be a factor in this and as you say tim we've found a lot of burials in one place outside of uh the walls of gloucester and there may well be more high to high status burials elsewhere that we haven't found yet which will kind of redress the balance and we could well be seeing the lower end of the of the economic scale being buried where we have done the most excavation up until now and so therefore they are more likely to have had um, unfortunately harder lives and um, been subject to um, interpersonal violence and, and other types of trauma I mean that's all we can say really at the moment I think that's good. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, of course, there is the military. That we do have a lot of military stuff, um, around. Yeah. Uh, stuff around as well. So that kind of adds to our argument. But I mean, like, like I mean, archaeology is theory. We we sit here in the twenty first century and we make theories about the past. And um, you know, it's good to have them challenged. And it's good to always think that we are only seeing a snapshot of of what's out there. And we could only form our theories from the evidence that we have. Okay, that's good. Uh, Philippa, anything from the finds that we should feed into this uh, consideration of the theory? So um, the Roman military equipment that comes from the sites is uh, um, first century and second century and isn't of the same date as the burials. So clearly um, we haven't got a lot of, we haven't got any late Roman military equi equipment coming with the burials, but that doesn't mean that they're not soldiers because absence of evidence doesn't really equate to evidence of absence. That's my That's get fair out enough. <laughs> the get out of jail card. And of course, uh, we always have to remember that when they're when they're uh, in their civilian settlements later on, they're probably not going to be equipped. Yeah, carrying huge amounts stuff. of it around. Yeah. Yeah. Sharon, is there anything we should just feed into the argument from the human remains side? Well, as I said in my talk, it's, it, it is just a theory. It's just looking at the evidence and trying to make it fit with some sort of, you know, explanation. Um, I did say that slavery is definitely an option, you know, with the injuries and, and such like that you're looking at could equally apply to slaves. Um, I just think that the cranial traumas are so sort of similar and, and particular that we're not looking just at bar brawls or anything here. This is something, something else going on. Um, and as I said, it, I've looked at other cemeteries around the country, trying to see if we've got something similar going on, maybe at York or London, which are also major colonial centres. Um, 
Clonia, sorry. And, you know, they just haven't got the same, the same sort of injuries. So I think there's something particular going on here in Gloucester, but can't quite work out what it is. So yeah, you know, as I say, it is a theory. Um, I'm open to other suggestions. <laughs> Good. Love okay. to hear We've got lots of things, lots of things to think about. We're going to take one more question in just a second, which is going to be for, for Mary. But uh, Laura Evis has just confirmed that the earlier burials are in fact represented there in the collection at Exeter, and, and it's probably what going on on there. So Mary, this is from uh, from Chris, and it's asking that uh, we mentioned about the Roman kilns that were looked at and survived in the 1960s development. So is there any new knowledge about the pottery industry which has been added from the work that we've been talking about tonight? I know we focused on the cemetery, but of course the uh, the pottery um, is kind of part of that. And in a sense, you started with that, so we'll finish with it yeah. as well. Uh, no, no not, not really, because by the time we got to excavate around that area um the uh, I, I think they mentioned even in the in the report in the in the 60s that the the bulldozer was in play while they were doing the rescue operations and by the time we got there there was not much left at all of these um kilns so no the only thing that we did get and i think i said it in my talk was that we got more pottery wasters um, which is, uh, you know, further evidence that those kilns were used for um, the manufacture of pottery. Um, yeah. Um, so Sounds like there's more work to do there as well in that case. Yeah, there, are, there, is, there were two types of pottery. I'm not a pottery expert. Um, there were two types of pottery identified from our excavations, um, which are, are probably associated with that kiln. Um, and I can tell you what they are, but I'm not a pottery expert. <laughs> they are fine that my caches or reduced fur in Gloucester fabric TF11A and possibly white slit Gloucester fabric TF3A. A good local um, pot, a good local pottery in that case. Yeah, right underneath in, the in other words, so it, it goes some way towards confirming that that type of pottery is being made there. But um, uh, more than that, I, I can't say, I'm afraid. That's OK. A good type fabric series number is a very appropriate place to finish <laughs> this evening. Um, and it's time really for me to draw, draw the evening to a close um, and to thank again our speakers for bringing us some fantastic detail of, of the cemetery and the site as a whole and its general context in Gloucester as well. I don't know about you, but I kind of feel that I've got to know one or two of the people in those graves through the accounts that we've had of, of what's with them and, and how it all works. So that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you for that. We don't have the possibility of doing a loud applause on this uh, webinar series, but um, think in your ears at the moment of the applause that's going around the room. I'd also just like to thank the, the team which has been uh, working in the background, Kaz Adams and, and Martin Watts have been driving this system for us and, and putting it all together. And I hope um, that uh, their work is, is, uh, has done what it's supposed to do and we've, we've delivered a good product. They're in the cockpit running the technology for all this. Thank you in, indeed for attending. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a little bit experimental. I hope we'll uh, be able to do something similar again. I hope you'll be able to join us next year. I'm not sure what format our Mick Aston lecture is going to be in next year, but on that matter, we would value your thoughts. And at the end of this webinar, there will be, or um, well, there is a little uh, questionnaire. There's just three questions on it. It's very simple. Uh, but do let us know what you think, because we'll use those views to put together our programme for next year and indeed for future years as well. So it's goodbye for me. Goodbye from the whole of the rest of the team. Uh, enjoy your evening. And we very much hope that we'll see you again next year. Cheerio.